Let me begin this talk on feminism and ARTs the way most feminists begin their own thinking, by quoting a man. <laughs> G.K. Chesterton challenged the charge of the equity feminists of his day that the work specific to women was tedious, small, and filled with drudgery. When people begin to talk about this domestic duty as not merely difficult, but trivial and dreary, I simply give up the question, for I cannot with the utmost energy of imagination conceive what they mean. When domesticity, for instance, is called drudgery, all the difficulty arises from a double meaning in the wor word. If drudgery only means dreadfully hard work, I admit the woman drudges in the home as a man might drudge at the Cathedral of Amiens or drudge behind a gun at Trafalgar. But if it means that the hard work is more heavy because it's trifling, colorless, and of small import to the soul, then as I say, I give up. I do not know what the word means. How can it be a large career to tell other people's children about the rule of three, and a small career to tell one's own children about the universe? How can it be broad to be the same thing to everyone and narrow to be everything to someone? No, a woman's function is laborious, but because it is gigantic, not because it is minute. It is the loss of the ability to see what Chesterton saw that so deeply marks much of feminist thought from its very beginning to our day, and which has made precisely motherhood, be it motherhood as such or motherhood as it, is conc as it concretely presents itself, the obstacle to her equality with men. I am aware that there are different feminisms, that there are those who make little of the body and those who want to make much of it. But in any case, these differences are for the most part made in view of a mutually agreed upon villain. Villains, they are chiefly two. On the one hand, women have not had their equal share in the kind of work that men have been doing from time immemorial. Everything that takes place outside of the domestic dwelling, tilling, hunting, painting, sculpting, thinking, bombing, fracking, revolutionizing, and the like. Men have always had a room of their own to repair to where they could pursue their own work, their own interests, free from domestic demands and noise. On the other hand, the work that women have done from time immemorial has not only prevented them from these pursuits, unless they manage to get a thought in edgewise, this fact has placed them in a position of deep dependence, especially economic, on the man who for his part was independent, as it is always said. It is the second problem that makes the first problem so pernicious and which led John Stuart Mill, the first feminist, to conclude that the family is the school of despotism. In the attempts to identify the origins of the subjection of women, much has been said, starting again with Mill, about the role of society in producing its desired nefarious effect. Simone de Beauvoir's famous tome was for the most part aimed at showing how and why one is not born but rather becomes a woman. What is more, according to this account, but Mill said at first, the construction of sexual difference is so inconspicuous that it risks not being recognized for what it is. Patriarchy is so powerful, says one of Simone's more radical followers, that it has a successful habit of passing itself off as nature. The insistence on this point shows how vehement is the denial that the roots of any alleged inequality, what others might call equal differences, could be found in nature itself. It is hard to notice, however, how nervous are those who hold the social construction theory when it comes to describing the bare facts of life. After making much of the projections of misogyny on the biology of the past, Simone de Beauvoir passes through the biological facts as, we, as, she, knows, as she knew them. There are two in particular which she finds disturbing. The first is that even once the biology has discovered the egg, that it contributes equally to the genetic makeup of the new being growing in its mother's womb, this contribution is still embarrassingly passive, motionless, with respect to the impatient, mobile sperm. What is more, in fertilization, the ovum is violated. It suffers the onslaught of the competing sperm. In short, the woman has been, to use all of her terms, taken, broken into, alienated, and is now tenanted by another. The second fact is even more intolerable since it is more imposing on the actual life of the woman. It is the fact that she, as compared to all other females in the animal world, is the one most absorbed by the fact of maternity since no other progeny takes longer to stand on its own two feet than the human child. 
The human mother is wholly subservient to maternity. Indeed, the human female body is the most problematic because the demands that her child makes on her are at odds with the fact that she belongs to the species at the top of a chain in which individual members are progressively acquiring more and more individuality. The more she is an individual, the more she is embattled by maternity, which subordinates her to the interests of the species, this having no individual benefit to the woman. <clears throat> For her, the human female is simply a living, walking contradiction in terms. <clears throat> I'm sure many people would agree with that, maybe for different reasons. <laughs> It appears then that even for Simone, well in advance of any education or socialization of the famous girl who will become a woman, the problem lies in her body. We are at the height of what Robert Spaman calls modernity's insurmountable stalemate between nature or body and person or freedom where the bodily object, subjected as it is to another's gaze because of its surface, to use the terms of Simone's lover, proves fatal for freedom. It is against this and this ultimately not just that per pernicious socialization that the woman resists and must resist. But resistance, as Simone said, is at the very heart of human nature and its society. Human nature is antifusis, a resistance against nature, though it's hard not to notice the lack of equality that it's, it's the woman in particular who has to do the resisting. The man doesn't have to do that as much. He has a different body. One is not left to guess what kind of resistance to nature Simone offers to women. It's resistance to maternity, which for the most part will take the form of either preventing it from occurring altogether or stopping it in its tracks should it occur. But there are hints in Simone's thought to suggest that it is not maternity per se that is the problem, were one able to imagine the possibility of it occurring in a different manner than it does now, with all of its humiliation and tyranny. Indeed, in her treatment of the biology of reproduction, her first chapter, she strategically presents the great variety of reproductive methods occurring in nature so that she can suggest at the end that neither kind of reproduction is more or less fundamental, such that we needn't read any kind of normativity into the way we reproduce. This is her conclusion, notwithstanding the consistent pattern of greater sexual differentiation and involvement of mothers with their young as you move up the chain of animal life in her own account. And it is a conclusion which serves to clear the way for her clear ironic preference for forms of reproduction which occur at the very bottom of the chain, the asexual multiplication in bacteria and in protozoa, hermaphroditic reproduction in plants, annelid worms and mollusks, the fertilization outside the female body as in the case of fish, toads and frogs allowing the males to do the child care as much as the females. <clears throat> She's particularly curious about parthenogenesis and the daring experiments to, that provoke it. Never mind the fact that all of these forms where sexual differentiation is minimal or non-existent occur at the lowest levels where there is the least amount of individualization, the very thing Simone is after. In any event, these alternatives offer grist to the mill of the human work of resistance against nature. Following Beauvoir, there was one feminist who was willing to finally call a spade a spade and say in an unadulterated way that the problem feminists have is with biological reality as such. Taking up the intuition of Engels and Marx, Shulamith Firestone said that all the class antagonisms at the level of society are themselves derived from the biological family, which is an inherently unequal power distribution by virtue of the natural reproductive differences and the division of labor they suggest. Firestone shared Beauvoir's view of human nature, of its stance with respect to its own nature, but writing 20 years later, she could envision more resources for her older sister's antifusis, her science fiction version, vision of what had to come about in order to fulfill feminist goals is chilling, not because of how aberrant it sounds, but because of how normal it has become and is becoming ever more. I quote her, to assure the elimination of sexual classes requires the revolt of the underclass women and the seizure of control of reproduction. Not only the full restoration to women of ownership of their own bodies, ownership of production, but also their seizure of control of human fertility the new population biology, as well as all the social institutions of childbearing and childrearing. 
The end goal of feminist revolution must be, unlike that of the first feminist movement, not just the elimination of male privilege, but of sex distinction itself. Genital differences between human beings would no longer matter culturally. The reproduction of the species by one sex for the benefit of both would be replaced by artificial reproduction. Children would be born to both sexes equally or independently of either, however one chooses to look at it. The dependence of the child on the mother, and vice versa, would give way to a greatly shortened dependence on a small group of others in general. The tyranny of the biological family would be broken. <clears throat> we need not look just to Marxists to find such preferences. We are already aware of the general suspicion of the family in the tradition of liberalism. For Mill, the family being the school of despotism that it was, inculcated in its members patterns of thought and action that were incompatible with democracy. Liberals disagree about the extent to which this is necessarily the case, and they disagree about the extent to which the private sphere of the family ought to be subjected to the principles belonging to the public sphere. Nussbaum, Martha Nussbaum, for example, faulted Rawls for letting the family and other such private associations off the hook, so to speak, a fault which he would quickly amend. But there is general agreement that the family is a suspected cause of all the alleged inequalities between men and women forbidden in a, in a proper liberal democracy, especially those in the marketplace, access to professions, female representation in boards, boardrooms, and wage equality on account of its placing on her shoulders a disproportionate share of the task of raising, nurturing, and caring for children. It thus almost seems regrettable when reference is made to the necessary the role the family still must play in liberal society. Says Rawls, the family is part of the basic structure, the reason being that one of its essential roles is to establish the orderly production and reproduction of society and of its culture from one generation to the next. Reproductive labor is socially necessary labor. Now given the problems inherent in the family, once there are new means of reproduction, is there any reason they should not be used? It is hard to imagine what they would be. Indeed, they are assumed when again Rawls continues saying, quote, no particular form of the family, monogamous, heterosexual, or otherwise, is so far required by a political conception of justice so long as it is arranged to fulfill these tasks effectively, the orderly reproduction of society over time, and does not run afoul of other political values. But we might ask more. Given the problems inherent in the traditional family, as we've known it until five minutes ago, why wouldn't these new means of reproduction become preferable, seeing as they are more in line with the political values, our political values? The desirability of new means of reproduction and other forms of family is obvious, as we will see in the next panel. But they are equally desirable on feminist terms, going back to the first manifestos. They have, of course, played a significant role in the lives of the older generation of motherhood-deferring feminists who found themselves turning to fertility clinics in the 11th hour, when the urge of motherhood finally caught up with them. But now, more strategically, we see this in the latest trend in gift giving to, to two daughters graduating from law school. Gift certificates to have their eggs frozen for use at a later date. The idea is that young women can now strategically reschedule motherhood without the nagging tick-tock of the biological clock, while avoiding the terrible plight of the previous generation who hadn't thought things through and who often left their fertility clinics without results or perhaps with results bearing many complications. The effects of older eggs, for example. All of this together with contraception, of course, conspires to allow women to achieve an individual autonomous identity apart from that of a wife and a mother, get their ducks in a row, so to speak, and on this basis, especially childlessness, to allow them to become the equals to men. Sarah Richard explains in her book, Advocating Egg Freezing, it's called Motherhood Rescheduled, she says this, instead of feeling like a victim paralyzed by anxiety, you feel more in command of your own destiny. It is that mindfulness that makes me do what I'm supposed to do to make my life go in the direction I want. It's about adopting a take charge attitude, which is one of our most fundamental American values. You might be right about that. <laughs> Naturally, take charge women could avoid motherhood altogether. There are those who promote ethical childlessness for purposes of women's equality, among other things. 
But since most women still do want to be mothers, with the help of egg freezing and the whole assortment of other ARTs that go with it, they can opt for motherhood at the end of a long, successful career. To put it in sociological language, instead of motherhood and marriage being uh, cornerstones, we would say vocational cornerstones, of an adult life, which radically define its course, marriage and motherhood will be capstones, crowning achievements, or trophies of a long adult life lived without them. They will be enjoyed, for the most part, but they will not alter the course nor the equality which has been achieved on account of their exclusion. As for the children born to these mothers living for the first time outside of time, their rescheduled births will be teaching moments in line with the very educational horizon of reproductive labor. To quote Rawls again, to ensure the future citizen's moral development and education into the wider culture, giving him or her a sense of justice and the political virtues that support just political and social institutions. So, in this case, children will learn their lessons how to leave their mothers alone by feeding and caring for themselves. Most importantly, their early institutionalization will keep them from noticing the implications of the misfortune of being born, as Locke called it. In time, they too will become like their mothers, free and unattached, ending up just where they began. At the end of the day, the problem with motherhood for equality feminism is that it comes at the wrong time, getting in the way of the establishment of the individual uh, independent subject. This is particularly clear in the recent debate over women and work. That debate was sparked by Anne-Marie Slaughter, a Princeton economist appointed to the Obama administration in his first term in office, who stepped down from that job and explained heretically in her Atlantic Monthly article why women still can't have it all. With an unusual frankness about her desire to be with her teenage sons who were acting badly at home alone, like mine, Slaughter... <laughs> Slaughter committed the unforgiv unforgivable sin and admitted to a few real, not socially constructed gender differences, chief among which is the fact that women don't feel the same way as men do about being away from their children. Deep down, I wanted to go home, not just I needed to go home, she says, and citing a recent study which found that women are less happy now than they were in 1972, not only but relative to men, Slaughter makes a sort of missionary appeal to women to join her on the happiness project. Let us rediscover the pursuit of happiness and let us start at home, she says. Slaughter uh, appeals to a full range of, of choices in the reverse, so to speak. Um, the choices that, that have to do with sort of being at home, you know, um, kinds of solutions which, which have to do with spending quantity time at home, making dinner, being there, those, those kinds of things. Um, and then she says, uh, why should we have to give, why can't we contribute to the world and without having to give up on things that define us as women. This, this gave a lot of relief to a lot of women who had already, if you will, stepped down, and, but, but had always felt like they, they weren't fighting for the, the cause. And so Slaughter gave her this, even though she stepped down to be a tenured professor of economics at Princeton, which can't be easy, but anyway, <laughs> she stepped down from her commuting in any event. Um, however, this relief that slaughter would give women would not last for long. Any attempt to rethink the terms of the relation between women and work is met with an adamant resistance. It questions the unquestionable article of faith that the equality between men and women will be achieved only when women are doing the same things that men do at the same level intensity and single-minded purpose with matching wages. It makes no difference that after decades of education in the curriculum of the Girl Project, young women themselves have decided in droves not to get on the famous corporate ladder, knowing, knowing now that they could get on it and reach the top. It makes no difference. It, no, it makes no difference how much evidence you present about the, the, the need that mothers have, the greater need that they have to be with their children, the greater need that children have to be with the mother. All of this evidence is inadmissible evidence for the, for the chief reason that it gets in the way of the project of equality, which is of one kind and one kind only. Now, Sheryl Sandberg of Lean In, the one who is not allowing us to use the word bossy anymore, made that one choice perfectly clear in her book that was rushed to the presses after the article of slaughter. Her Lean In book, and now the many Lean In communities, together with the now influential Lean In Foundation, and all her presence on Facebook, of course, enjoys women 
she doesn't really, she doesn't make any kind of argument, a counter argument against Slaughter. Slaughter makes that kind of argument, you know, based on nature, if you will, but, but, but Sandberg doesn't. It's a very superficial book, but it's really very in influential, so it has to be taken, taken seriously to some extent. Um, she doesn't really make any kind of counter argument. She just, uh, she just offers a kind of new modern Girl Scout manual, you know, to sort of just try harder, just try harder. So leaning in for her is, is this just trying harder. So she's countering this obstacle she finds. So there are obstacles in society, but there are also these obstacles within women themselves that when they approach the age of maternity or have, you know, want to have children or have them or about to have them, they start leaning out. They start losing their aspirations. And that's not allowed in Sheryl Sandberg's universe. Um, that's not allowed because, again, it, 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 it presents an obstacle for the one project and the one acceptable project only. The one choice, the one dream, a future for women without limits, which in Sandberg's mind is limited to the holding a power job unhindered by children and any remaining uncooperative fathers. <clears throat> so it's important to see for all the talk about choice, there's always only one real acceptable choice for the sort of official line on this question of women and work or motherhood and work. By flipping the terms of the debate around, I'd like to say that the issue really isn't, the thing to see is that the issue really isn't about whether it's okay for women to work and not feel guilty about it, putting aside, of course, the fact that women who are working, or that is, raising their children, are working already. It's rather whether or not she's not allowed to work, especially not at a power job, and thereby contribute to wage inequality and slow down the, 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 the goal, the achievement of the goal. Obviously, no one would be caught dead saying she couldn't. If we are all supposed, no one would be caught dead saying a woman couldn't choose to stay home. Since, if we're all supposed to chart our own course, that too has to be an option, no? So long, however, as it is chosen for no other reason than pure empty choice and not for reasons such as the more powerful leaning of women and children towards more quantity time with their children. At the very least, any social and political encouragement of the gender division of labor by making it less costly, or allowing it to be less costly, should be eliminated just to make sure it's voluntary. That's another quote from Rawls. But to put it in other terms, the question is, if there is any real legitimate and respectable choice for women other than to make common cause with the dominant idea of equality and serve the ideal household of its regime, a two full-time power career household enthralled to the corporate economy for most of its meals and consumer goods, and the state and its institutions for welfare for the care and education of its ART-assisted lately conceived children, Noting the, effeminity of equity, no, noting the affinity of equity feminism with the industrialized workplace, especially as regards the hegemony of choice, Christopher Lash, who is fantastic, recently died, wrote in one of his essays the following. The feminist movement recognizes only one choice, the family in which adults work full time in the industrialized marketplace. Its demand for state-supported programs of daycare discriminates against parents who choose to raise their children and forces everyone to conform to the dominant pattern as the irresistible product of social developments analogous to the development of technology, which automatically renders old ways obsolete. The two-career family represents progress and laggards have to fall in line, such as the logic feminists have borrowed from the marketplace. Let me know quickly here that notwithstanding all the talk about having it all, family and work, I mean, we could say a lot about how little family and how little work we have in trying to have it all. It's not hard to imagine what becomes of a home when there are two full-time power job careers sleeping in the master bedroom. There's very little life inside, very little relation with neighbors, very little socializing. Um, the home is a kind of empty um, dormitory, so. Um, we could also speak about how little work there is, and it's really striking when you read this, this, this book about work, right? How little, frankly, how nothing she has to say about the meaning of work or the reason for work. It's all very tautological. Women are supposed to lean in to have a power career, to have a power career. And if anything, to effect change, such as 
you know, corporate, uh, corporately funded or federally mandated and funded daycare so that other women can have careers to have careers. It's not in relation to anything. So, I mean, there's a broader question there of what's become of the home after the Industrial Revolution. Christopher Lash is really excellent on this point. You both, you, you, on the one hand, you have an empty home, but you also have a problem with the very meaning of work. What is it we're working for? What is it we're doing to make the world a better place? So finally, let me say uh, in conclusion, naturally women have always worked and always will. The question that is not about whether or not they work, but whether or not the work specific to them counts for work, whether it is equal to, to men's work, if, if you can use such debased language. <clears throat> That is, and whether or not that work has any relation to whatever work they do beyond that. These are crucial questions, and their answers will determine to a large extent how and when women will have their children, now that that too is optional. So we're all familiar with John Paul II and his coining of the term feminine genius in his beautiful encyclical on women. And that, that genius is, is that specific work or genius or talent that women have tied to their aptness for motherhood, whether they are physical mothers or not. And that, that aptness for motherhood gives them this special sensitivity for what is essentially human. And he thought that that was really, the valuing of that was really dying. And that, you know, that has to be valued. Um, but that, that so the, the, the question wasn't so much that, that women, you know, you know, if you just stay at home, if you will, never work. But that, the extent to which you value that, then when, when women you know, do other things besides sort of raising their young children and feeding them and caring for them, that they, they, do, they do everything that they do in the world from the point of their motherhood. And it's always striking to me how, how, how much it's the case that the, 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 the very women in public sort of who are the, the, the kind of examples of a lean-in sort of thing, um, not only do they demean the genus of women as John Paul II would have called it, but they, they, they absolutely do nothing to represent it in the public, in the, in, in the public workplace. So the issue really isn't you know, getting a lot of women out there in the, in the public, but the issue is what, what relation does the public have or the public square have, or what, do, what relation does work have with the home? You know, and the extent to which you value the home, and specifically what a woman does, will have a lot to do with what you say about the nature of, of the, its relation to the world, okay, and vice versa, of course. The rediscovery of the feminine genius by John Paul II and, of course, by Chesterton before him, and we could also talk about the maternalists, they're very interesting, is refreshing to many women for many reasons, not the least of which is that it puts a finger on something deeper than mere empty choice. It names what they experience even when, especially when, they are exerting so much energy to stifle it by leaning in. Their experience of deprivation, as George Grant would call it, has in many ways opened up to them another way of thinking about equality. Listen to what Miriam Zoll, who worked for Planned Parenthood, is currently on the board of Our Bodies Ourselves, says in her recent book, Cracked Open, Liberty, Fertility, and the Pursuit of High-Tech Babies. She describes her independent, driven, and motherless life up to the age of 40, and she writes, by the time I turned 40, my career had become the center of my life and my purpose for living. It was the identity by which I measured my value and my worth. I began to feel the first pangs of motherhood. I was very careful to submerge these sensations, place them far out of view behind all other important deadlines I needed to meet. So she, that's, that's how she describes her life up to 40. Then she succumbs to the sensations of motherhood and she knocks at the fertility door and leaves empty-handed. And she writes this. Just because the doctor appointments, the injections, the egg transfers, the dashed hopes are over, it does not mean that the trauma is over. The sense of violation that many women say they still, still feel years later, coupled with the deep, deep sadness of not having born a child, lingers in our lives like a persistent mosquito buzzing in a dark room. There are other deprivations associated with the fertility clinics, even if one doesn't leave empty-handed. They've been described by people like, well, like by Fleming and by Shulevitz um, more recently. They are the sexless procedures, the degrading collections, the reproductive tourism, surrogacy. Then, too, there are also the concerns, for example, that recently uh, Shulevitz of Atlantic Monthly has voiced about 
um, the, the problem children born of these, of these older eggs. Okay, a lot of problems. In the end, Zoll makes a confession that would have Beauvoir organizing a protest in her grave. Quote, ironically, for the first time in my life, I had actually wanted my identity to be defined by my female biology. I wanted my daily routines to be dictated by an infant's needs rather than having to actively choose and construct a life. Finally, there are any number of confessions from feminists such as Zoll showing how much nature has come back to bite them as they stood over it, resisting it. One would think that we had learned our lessons. But just as the alarms have started to ring, there is a new resurgence, I think, of the old lines supported this time with political force, as, for example, the new health care law, which promotes delayed motherhood through contraception on the grounds precisely of furthering the governmental interest in promoting gender equality. There are also other long-desired policy moves in the wings waiting for the first woman president to come along to keep women from leaning out when motherhood finally does come. They are usually buried in claims about the educational needs of children and even babies. All of these moves will enable and entrench habits of leaning in by making motherhood easier to delay, more successful, genetically speaking, when it is finally entertained, and making it a negligible factor in the concrete life of a woman when the baby has to be fed and cared for. It will make it harder then for young women to see that the issue is not just a matter of being more technologically savvy than their anguished four sisters, but of reconsidering the whole feminist project root and branch, that calculating lonely and sterile project of making our lives go in the direction we want. We can only hope that the nature will bite back again and that there will be witnesses, moreover, of a happier way, throwing ourselves no holds barred into the adventure of faithful love quoting Kierkegaard, the most important vo voyage of discovery a human being undertakes, marriage, fully immersed in life with all of its twists and turns and all the necessary adjustments along the way. <laughs>